Hello, and welcome back to Picks and Portraits. Welcome back to our series on retrofuturism in video games. We are pretty deep in the holiday season, and I'm sure for many of you out there, this period, Christmas, is linked with video games. Year after year, generation after generation, consoles and games are the must-have gifts of the season. However, in terms of cultural relevance, one company stands above the rest, Nintendo. For many, Nintendo is synonymous with video games. It is the Disney of video games. They revitalized the entire video game industry after its collapse, which is where we left off last time and where we will be picking up today. We are going to be looking at Nintendo's rise in the West and how it used the future to sell itself to a generation of consumers. Before we get into that though, this and every video on this channel was made possible by our patrons over at patreon.com slash picksandportraits. This channel is monetized, nothing is made from ads, we are 100% viewer supported in an exchange offer a ton of Zeusa videos on the future, nostalgia, uh, liminality. You can now join Patreon on the free tier and get all your updates there. Going forward, Sleepcore will also be ad free over there for everyone for free, so come join us. You can make my holiday merry and bright and get access to hundreds of Azusa videos by joining one of the pay tiers as well. Help keep these videos coming out. Patreon.com slash Picks and Portraits. Also, very excited to announce Sleepcore merch is now available. T-shirts, stickers, mugs, and more. You can find a link to everything in the description. So if you can, please consider supporting us. With those plugs out of the way, let's head back to the future. In 1983, the booming video game industry crashed. Now, this often gets pinned on one game, E.T. for the Atari, which highlighted a lack of quality control that was rampant at the time. It was produced in just six weeks, so it could be out for the 1982 holiday season. The game sold very well, but it was notoriously bad. Poor graphics, janky controls, hundreds of thousands of copies were returned. It damaged Atari's reputation with consumers. At the time, Atari was industry leader, and this reflected very poorly on the industry as a whole. People were less likely to buy games, and stores were less likely to stock them. Another factor was market saturation. There were too many consoles and too little difference between them. There was only so much shelf space, people only had so much money, and they just stopped spending. Between 1982 and 1985, sales dropped from $3.2 billion to just $100 million. Companies went bankrupt, and consumers moved on. Despite the industry crashing, 1983 did give us this great Atari commercial that is on brand for our series and the season. Santa visits a family on a futuristic spaceship. He comes bearing gifts, obviously, Atari games, before beaming out. I uh, just wanted to sneak that in. The same year the industry crashed, a console was released that would eventually help bring it back to life, the Family Computer, or Famicom, made by Nintendo. Nintendo was no stranger to video games. They had produced several for arcades, which we looked at in episode two, I believe. They also had the Color TV game series, first released in 1977. Like the Magnavox, several consoles were released, with updated games preloaded up until 1980, which is when Nintendo's Game & Watch series of handheld games debuted, but nothing would have the impact that the Famicom did. Now, as a reminder, we are going to be focusing mostly on marketing material for our futuristic depictions, though we are getting pretty advanced graphically. Also, retrofuturism is not necessarily just predictions of the future set in a specific year. It is also an aesthetic that embodies the cutting edge, tomorrow today kind of stuff. Much of what we are going to be looking at falls into this category, starting with the first commercial for the Famicom. Uh, the system itself is pretty futuristic, very sleek, in line with space age design. In 1984, a Zapper controller was released. The Famicom version was a much more realistic looking pistol, uh, the North American version took a more sci-fi design, as we'll see. Probably the most futuristic aspect of the Famicom was Rob the Robot, released in 1985. The 80s were robot obsessed, we had Rocky IV, Short Circuit, uh, the Japanese commercial introducing Rob is probably also the most futuristic thing we'll be seeing today. It takes place in a very futuristic city with armed game police that apparently hunt a man down for gaming. Rob functions similar to the Zapper. Its sensors responded to flashes from the screen, so the player would input something, the screen would flash a certain pattern, and Rob responded to that. 
Rob's capabilities were really only utilized in two games, Gyromite and Stack Up. However, Rob would be instrumental in introducing Westerners to the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, Entertainment System, not video game. This was how Nintendo repackaged the Famicom in North America, with Rob as the focal point. Uh, you see him in much of the early advertising. His toy-like appearance allowed him and the NES to be marketed as a toy rather than a video game, which the public was still soured on. The console itself got a makeover as well, taking the appearance, um, I guess, of a front-loading VCR. I mentioned earlier the Zapper's glow up. It took on a more futuristic design. I'm sure this had a lot to do with not wanting the Zapper to look realistic, instead more like a toy. This marketing strategy worked wonders. The NES was a hit, and Nintendo very quickly moved away from Rob and the idea that it was not a video game console. In this futuristic ad from around its launch, uh, it would be reused later. I've seen it uh, labeled as both 1985 and 1987, but a group of cyberpunk youths walk onto a spaceship as a narrator asks, what will the future bring from Nintendo before showing off several games? It's pretty wild <laughs> that this is the first mention of Super Mario Brothers in our timeline. The console's killer app and the breakthrough appearance of the company's mascot, Mario. Mario first appeared in Donkey Kong in arcades, 1981, and in Mario Brothers in 1983, but Super Mario Brothers is very much the beginning of Mario as a global pop culture icon. Mario wouldn't have any futuristic adventures for a couple of decades, but he did appear in this 1987 print ad for the Famicom 3D system. This was an accessory that only came out in Japan. It displayed certain games or certain parts of games in 3D, but it failed. Still, great illustration. If we are looking for a game set in the future, we need look no further than Nintendo's science fiction franchise, Metroid. Released in 1986, Metroid follows bounty hunter Samus Aran as she hunts down parasites known as Metroids. It takes place in 20X5, uh, which is a weird way of representing a date. I've seen 20X, 20XX, but never the X replacing the third numeral, kind of weird. Standard sci-fi fare in terms of plot or lore, heavily inspired by Ridley Scott's Alien, narrow corridors, sparse ambient soundtrack, uh, one of the bosses is also named Ridley. As a lot of what we were seeing is advertising, it's uh, interesting seeing the difference in how games were marketed in the East and the West. In North America, a player is sucked into the TV to assume the role of Samus. In the Japanese Famicom commercial, there are these awesome tokusatsu-like scenes of Samus riding a disc. This is because in Japan, it was released for another Japanese-only peripheral, the Famicom Disk System. This was an add-on for the Famicom that allowed games to be played off of a floppy disk. This was marketed as the beginning of a new age in gaming. Spoiler, it wasn't. Nintendo would return to cartridges. But one really interesting thing about the disk system is that games could be rewritten. This kiosk would be in stores and consumers could bring in their old games and have new games written on the same disk. Kinda cool. 1988 was the year Nintendo really broke in North America. It was the hottest toy that holiday season, sold out everywhere, concern everywhere. Parents and child psychologists were on every news entertainment program, expressing fears that this was damaging kids' development, harming them. It was huge. A lot of their very aggressive marketing was centered on power. Now you're playing with power. This isn't like those old Atari games. This is the future. They even had a movie that revolved around the NES, The Wizard, which famously featured the next thing we are going to be looking at, another peripheral, the Power Glove. It's so bad. <laughs> this looks like something straight out of the future, a programmable glove that replaced the controller and lets you interact with games using only the movement of your hand. Different games had different codes you had to input in order for it to work, and I use that term lightly. What it promised to do and what it did was very different. In North America, the Power Glove was produced by Mattel. The commercial for it isn't the most futuristic, but the Japanese one featured Robocop and was used to promote that game. Uh, we actually have an entire video breaking down the future of Robocop over on Patreon. Uh, this commercial used some Terminator iconography as well. Pretty cool stuff. We are going to be wrapping up today with Nintendo's return to handheld gaming, the Game Boy, released in 1989. This was a portable console that boasted having all the power of Nintendo in the palm of your hand. Again, power. Hugely successful console, thanks in no small part to Tetris and its casual appeal. 
The Game Boy was first marketed with this very sci-fi inspired futuristic commercial. A player is pitted against an evil looking robot, showing you you could link your console to other consoles. The packaging is also pretty futuristic with the vector background. It's pretty amazing seeing how far we've come in the three decades since where we started the series, Birdie the Brain, the illusion of interactivity, to having a pocket-sized gaming device. The advancement of technology, the future coming to be. I would love to continue this series into the 90s in the 16-bit era, but that is going to be it for today. I will post links to relevant material in the description. Let me know what you think. This was not meant to be exhaustive. I know we also focus mostly on first-party Nintendo. We could do a whole video on Mega Man alone. I'm sure there was a lot else I missed, so let me know. Check out the other videos in the series if you want more festive retrofuturism. We have an entire video on Christmas in the future as well. Give us a thumbs up, that helps out a lot. Subscribe if you haven't, and again, if you have the means, please consider becoming a patron, patreon.com slash portraits. You can also join for free and follow our uploads, get Sleepcore ad-free, buy a t-shirt, a sticker, like and share this video, everything helps. We will have more content going up throughout the holidays, but this is very likely the last time you will hear from me. So, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all so much for another amazing year. Thanks for watching, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and all the best for 2024. See you in the future.